Let's start from the beginning. The cosmos is around 13 billion years old. That's really old. Okay, and in that context, we're a very young species. Humans arrive around three, four hundred thousand years ago, um, anatomically identical to all of us, um, and they're very successful. They migrate to a bunch of places, they master fire, but broadly speaking, not much changes until around 12,000 years ago, the advent of agriculture, the Neolithic Revolution. Now, 12,000 years ago, 10,000 BC, there are around five million of us walking the face of the earth, about the population of Ireland today. Um, and what happens with agriculture is that between 10,000 BC and 1800 AD, we go from 5 million to 1 billion. I mean, impressive, you know, real growth. But then something even more dramatic changes, probably not as big a rupture as agriculture, but it's called the Industrial Revolution. And very quickly, we go from 1 billion in 1800 to 2 billion in 1920, 3 billion, 4 billion. And presently, we add about a billion people every 15, 16 years. Now, this century, and I think we're all hopefully going to be alive to see it, it's probably about the 2050s. This century, we're going to see something really remarkable, which is for the first time in a really long time, we're going to see the planet's human population stagnate and probably actually start to decline. So before 2100, we're looking at a planetary population around 10 billion people. That's the, that's the peak. That's a lot of people, and they'll be very demanding in terms of our planet's resources, but that's, that's an important thing to remember. And the reason why it's going to hit 10 billion and then either flatten or, or actually decline is because we're having fewer children. Okay. And that's a, that's a global planetary phenomenon, which seems to map onto literacy rates, uh, gender equality, high GDP, uh, high levels of secondary education. You know, we, we see immediately falling birth rates. It's almost like a, a social law. So we live, um, we're, uh, we're having fewer children. Then secondly, we're living longer. And I think, actually, uh, my grandmother is a nice uh, way of understanding this. She offers a nice example. My grandmother's 96. She was born in 1926. Um, she was one of eight. And they all survived. Now, for the whole of human history, it was very common to have large families. What wasn't common was for all the children to survive into adulthood. What changed after the early 1900s is infant mortality, early years mortality, disappears, which is why a country like Iran, where she's from, can go from 10 million people in 1900 to around 80 million people today. And uh, it'll probably be about 100 million in, in 20 years' time. She, in turn, has six children, three boys, three girls. Those six children have six grandchildren. And today, those six grandchildren have given her no great-grandchildren. You can see where this is going, can't you? People are having fewer kids generation on, on, on generation. Now, I also have a niece. Her name is Zara. She's six. Uh, and while the possibility of my grandmother living to 100 when she was born in 1926, it was more than 100 to 1. Actually, Zara, who is six, I think, uh, she has, statistically speaking, uh, an evens chance of reaching 104. If we see trends since the 1840s carry on, which they might not, but hey, they also might accelerate, then she has a 50-50 chance of living to 104. And I think this is such a useful thought experiment for everybody here. You know, my grandmother, born in 1926, saw the general strike. You know, she was, she was born when Adolf Hitler was coming out of prison. He hadn't even ascended the, the, to power yet. She was there for fascism, the collapse of the European uh, colonial empires. She was there for the New Deal, Second World War, space race, Cold War, internet. She's still alive. And I wonder what are the things that Zara's going to see by the early 2100s? What kind of a planet is she going to see? What kinds of technologies will be around? And I think we often overstate the capacity for change in the short term, but underestimate it in, in the long term. Uh, and things are going to change a heck of a lot in her life. And, and one of the trends underpinning that, and there are three big trends, I think, actually, that she'll see throughout her life. One of the trends, like I said, is demographic aging. The other two are urbanization and climate change. The science fiction writer Bruce Sterling has a wonderful formulation. He says that by 2050, we'll be a planet of older people, old people. Please don't get sensitive. I'll be old. We all get you know, older. It's a wonderful thing about all, a very equalizing uh, phenomenon. By 2050, we'll be a planet of older people in big cities afraid of the sky, which I think is a, a wonderful formulation. It's so archaic and primitive, uh, but it would be basically what's going on. Large cities, older people, and catastrophic climate change. So why is this a problem? I mean, these are good things, right? Living longer is a good thing. If my niece can live to 104, fantastic. Um, if we're having fewer children, that's great. I mean, it's manageable, right? You see 
countries like China and trying to become higher GDP countries, they say it's a good thing to have lower birth rates. So why am I saying this poses challenges on, on a par with climate change? That's ridiculous. Well, it comes down to something called the dependency ratio. And this is new, this is new material for me, right? This is my next book, so I will be referring to my notes sometimes. Today across the world, there are 6.3 people of working age for every person over 65. 6.3. The UN claims that figure will fall to 3.4 to 1 by 2050, and 2.4 to 1 by 2100. So it's 6.3 people of, of working age for every person over 65 today. By 2100, it's 2.4. And what that means is we will have an ever larger cluster of people in our society, it's called the oldest old, living to 90, 95, 100, 105, who have extraordinary care needs. Now, at the beginning of the 20th century, the leading causes of death were often uh, flu, uh, cholera, it was infection. And then, of course, we get a bunch of new technologies, and that becomes less an issue. Today, the leading causes of death globally are age-related. Uh, cardiac disease, cancer, stroke. And actually, do you know what the biggest cause of death in the UK is now for the last sort of five, six years? It's dementia, which is remarkable. I mean, that's actually the, that signifies a hugely successful society. If people, people are dying because they just, you know, that's kind of as far as we can go as a species so far, then that's a, a real sign of, of progress. But it also means really big problems because cancer treatment, uh, treatment for heart disease, stroke, can be quite resource-intensive. Resource but as anybody here who has an older relative knows or a friend who's suffering from dementia or cognitive decline, that is extraordinarily expensive to deal with, very expensive. And so the idea that we're somehow going to have what we presently have, this weird amalgam of the market and the state, to look after millions of people in our societies with cognitive impairments and dementia. Clearly ridiculous. So the first thing I would propose to take away, and I know when we have these talks that, I mean, I come to talks, so I barely remember anything. I sometimes remember one thing. The one thing I would want to impress on people is the need for a, a national care service for people in older age. It's going to become a necessity. I think even centre-right politicians will be demanding it soon. And people say, well, we can't afford a national care service. It's too expensive. You've got it the complete wrong way around. We can't afford not to have a national care service. A great example is the US. The US spends today, I love doing this, because I, I did a TED talk in Vancouver recently. It's really great to put this in the face of North Americans. Although Canadians have a public health care system in their, in their defense. In the US, they spend around, and these change all the time with COVID and whatnot, but the US spends around 17% of its economy, its GDP on health care, 17%. The UK spends around 9%. Now, I know it's not perfect in the UK. We could probably bump it up by one or two percent, and we'd have the sort of service we had 10, 11 years ago, which I thought was, personally, I thought was a very good service. So they spend more of their economy on healthcare, and yet, lower life expectancy, more women die in childbirth, higher rates of infant mortality, and tens of millions of people aren't covered. So, I mean, I think the UK system of, of what you'd call single payer, maybe in the US is the closest analog, that makes sense if you've got this challenge of, of elderly care. So let's look at some of the numbers. In 2013, Standard & Poor found that as a result of demographic aging, 60% of the countries they analyzed would see their credit status reduced to junk within a generation. Three years later, they published a less pessimistic report, which was only a quarter of countries. But hold on, these are pretty big countries. They noticed that Ukraine, Brazil, China, Saudi Arabia all face major problems purely as a result of demographic aging. In the UK, the cost of health and social care, the state pension and other benefits are forecast to increase annual spending by 2.5% of GDP every year in the decade after 2020. The, the specific data for the UK, between 2016 and 2030, Britain's over 65s will grow by a third, while the oldest old, those people who need really extensive resources and, and care and attention, uh, those over 85 will almost double. So when politicians talk about balancing the books, a small state, my God, you really, you really have, I think, lost the plot. You look at climate change, you clearly need a bigger state. And I think you look at something like demographic aging, again, you need a bigger state. We're, we're going to have a real problem on our hands if, they, if people think that Serco and Sodexo and Capita and G4S are going to sort this out. They can't even do Olympic security. Or re re oh, it's true. Or recruitment for the British Army. It, or, OK, and so. When Carillion collapses, OK, well, it's a construction company. Oh, OK, some business get hit and some tradespeople, they went bankrupt. It's terrible. But 
we, we can't have we can't have companies like this failing and collapsing when we've got people in elderly care who aren't even cognitively capable of helping themselves. This is a serious, serious point, and I hope it gains a, a consensus across the, the political divide. But it's not just the economics of this, of, a, of, a, of an aging society, of a, of, a, of a society of older people and big cities afraid of the sky. This goes beyond just public policy and, and welfare and, and and the taxpayer and, and how we're going to have to order our, our state and our market and their relationship to one another. It goes beyond that. Because demographic aging is also going to inflect our political cultures. Um, we are going to become gerontocracies. Again, this is not meant to be critical. Whenever I talk about this thing, people say, you're being, you know, you're being ageist. I'm going to be old too. You know, when I'm talking about 2050, I'll be one of the older people. Uh, and I think this is an important conversation for us to have as a, as a species. It's one of the things we share. We all grow old. Uh, so I, I would really be upset if you thought I was being ageist when I say we're going to become gerontocracies, because in a way it's already, it's already starting to happen. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.